war finally broke out in 1974. Tension had been building for weeks on the borders. Like most wars, it would begin with a single murder, the first of many, spiralling into a conflict that would last four long years and wipe an entire community from the face of the earth. But this was not war as we know it. This was a conflict between factions of an entirely different species, the chimpanzees of Gombe National Park in Tanzania. The Kasakila had once been a single community, but by 1973 a splinter community had formed. Southern separatists had taken land for themselves, seeking autonomy, freedom. They were the Kahama. But this taste of freedom was to be short-lived. Methodically, brutally, the Kasakila wiped out the Kahama, killing all six males in the group, one by one, and taking their territory. To quote Jane Goodall, who had been watching them for years, Our peaceful and idyllic world, our little paradise, had been turned upside down. Suddenly, I had found that chimpanzees could be brutal, that they, like us, had a dark side to their nature. Often I awoke at night with horrific pictures of violence in my mind, of adult chimpanzees, their lips smeared with the blood of another, twisting and breaking the bones of a victim, of Madame B lying hidden under the vegetation, slowly dying of her terrible wounds, while her ten-year-old daughter tried to comfort her, gently grooming her and keeping the flies away. And so warfare was discovered not only to be a human weakness. Chimpanzees, it turned out, our closest evolutionary cousins also waged war for territorial gain, living in complex, hierarchical societies where violence, cunning and deceptive behaviours were utilised to attain and maintain social dominance. Goodall saw a beguiling and at times brutal game of political intrigue comparable to those we see in our own human societies. Like humans, chimpanzees don't act purely on animal instinct, they are aware of their own thoughts. This metacognition allows them to be capable of great empathy. They have a strong sense of morality similar to that of humans. And yet, they war. And so, as science delves deeper into our evolutionary past, revealing how closely related we are to our ape cousins, the question arises, how similar are our brains? Is this intrinsic pull towards power dynamics and social manipulation of brutal warfare and craving for territory a poignant echo of our evolutionary heritage? Are we somehow special or a little more than bipedal, technologically dependent apes? The world is trapped in time. Each species, from the simplest cell to the most complex animal, is static, locked in forms that have never once changed since the very dawn of creation. Today, this idea is inconceivable. From a young age, we are taught that we live on a dynamic planet, that with each rotation of our blue and green Earth, all life is subject to an invisible force which continuously drives change. It is as inevitable a force as gravity, and even we humans, for all our technological prowess, are not immune to it. In just the last million years, a geologic blink of an eye, the world has borne witness to the rise and fall of at least seven human species, with just one, our own, persisting through the ravages of time. However, prior to the 19th century, the vast majority of the Western populace believed themselves to live in a world absent of this force. In the minds of our forebears, everything had an essence, a set of defining characteristics that had always, and would always, remain the same. Life was perpetual, and nothing would ever change it.
It was only with the onset of the Industrial Revolution and the ushering in of a period of unprecedented scientific discovery that a revolution in our knowledge of life on Earth would occur. Deep in the tropical heart of the Malay archipelago, one revolutionary mind was engulfed in finding the answers to a question that most of the world hadn't even thought of answering yet. He conceived a theory that species evolve over time and are influenced by environmental pressures that favour certain traits. He called this process natural selection. But this curious mind did not belong to the famous English naturalist Charles Darwin. This was a man called Alfred Russell Wallace, who independently conceived the notions of species evolution and natural selection. Darwin, who had earlier embarked on a voyage of discovery aboard the HMS Beagle, had also been refining a similar theory. And it was in 1858 that these two revolutionary thinkers came together to publish their ideas. Backed by extensive research and fieldwork, their theories could not be ignored. And thanks to Wallace and Darwin, we know that we humans are not separate, but an intrinsic part of the animal kingdom. And it was in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, that Darwin made an even more radical suggestion. Darwin claimed that not only did humans evolve from an ape-like ancestor, but that we also share many of our characteristics, including both physical and behavioural features with our ape relatives. Most people in the 1870s had never seen a non-human ape before, but to the well-travelled Darwin, the similarities between us were obvious. Perhaps the most striking parallels were in the movement and behaviour of apes. Take their facial expressions. Most animals cannot move their faces to communicate. Think of rodents. Without mobile lips and brows, they are incapable of showing emotion with their faces. Like many animals, rodents rely on body language and vocalisations to communicate their feelings. But primates, including humans, can use facial expressions to let others know how we feel. One only has to watch a group of primates for a short while to notice the wide range of facial expressions they use in their day-to-day -day lives. Like humans, many primates, especially the apes, are capable of emoting happiness, amusement, anger, surprise and fear, all through the movement of their faces, reflecting a valuable adaptation to living in complex social groups where communication truly is key. Then there are the anatomical similarities between other apes and humans. Apes, for example, have opposable thumbs, just as we do, which allow them to grasp and manipulate objects with the kind of precision that most other mammals lack. Although they are generally quadrupedal animals, they can quite comfortably adopt a bipedal posture when the need arises, whether it be for display, foraging, or to free up the hands when carrying something, bipedalism is a fundamental part of an ape's daily life. And so Darwin saw these similarities. The difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. In other words, we are not as different from the rest of the animal kingdom as we might think. In our anatomy and our behaviour, we carry the legacies of our ape ancestors but we also possess unique characteristics, honed by millions of years of evolutionary fine-tuning. But in reality, it was even more cut and dry. Humans are not something new, something separate, developed away from distant ape ancestors. Very simply, scientifically, humans are apes. This was an entirely new perspective, one that posited our minds were a product of evolution, just as much as our bodies were. For most people at the time, this was a difficult concept to entertain. Christian ideology taught that humans were created in God's own image, so the suggestion that we actually shared an ancestor with apes was considered by many to be the height of blasphemy. Darwin himself even referred to his work as the Devil's Gospel. But just how similar are the brains of humans and our ape relatives. Wallace and Darwin never fully answered the question, and despite all the breakthroughs in our knowledge of human origins that we owe to them, it was not until the 20th century that true advances were made.
Once the scientific community accepted the existence of evolution, they began to look for a missing link. An extinct creature that lay somewhere in between other apes and humans. Such a creature was thought likely to be found in Eurasia, with a larger brain than living apes, but would probably retain ape-like features like adaptations for life in the trees. And yet this, as it transpired, could not have been further from the truth. In 1924, Raymond Dart, an Australian anatomist, had been working at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg when he received a peculiar package from a quarry near to the small town of Tang. Wrapped with care were several fossilised remains, amongst which were the front portion of a skull and a near-perfect cast of the brain case of some long-dead creature. A weak start worked meticulously to extract the skull and the brain case, known as an endocast, from the stubborn rock. With every painstaking tap of his tools, he unveiled more of the delicate fossil, eventually revealing the face of someone who lived millions of years ago. Scientifically speaking, it was the first specimen of Australopithecus africanus, and the fossil was somewhere between 2.5 and, and 2.8 million years old. As with Wallace and Darwin's monumental ideas, Dart's discovery was initially met with scepticism. Many scientists, predominantly in Europe, held to the idea that large brains were the first step that set us apart from our primate ancestors. In their minds, human brains must have evolved before any other human-like traits. However, the fossil, which came to be known as the Tongue Child, with its small brain but human-like teeth and upright posture, implied by the structure of the base of the skull, defied this conventional narrative. Despite being more closely related to us than any other existing ape, the brain of the Tongue Child was actually more similar to a chimpanzee's than to a modern human's, though it did bear intriguing hints of more derived features, like portents of what was to come. The estimated position of the larynx, for instance, suggested the possibility of speech, a critical feature of human communication. As well as this, the structure of the frontal cortex, an area associated with complex cognitive tasks in humans, hinted at early developments in tool use, social interaction, and problem-solving skills. And so even with its small size, the brain of the tongue child suggested a complexity of behaviour and cognition beyond that of living apes, and gave credence to the idea that our cognitive evolution was a gradual process, taking millions of years to reach the kind of complexity seen in modern humans. Those who accepted the tongue child as an extinct member of our lineage quickly began to think of it as the missing link. And although we know now there is no such thing, and that our evolutionary origins are much more complex, the story of this incredible discovery serves as a testament to our evolutionary journey. A long, drawn-out tale of transformation from ape-like ancestors to modern humans. It reminds us of our humble origins and the remarkable, often winding path that led us to become what we are today. But the question remained. How far along this path have we truly travelled? How much of our cognition is still in the plains of ancient Africa? The sun peeks out over the emerald canopy, its rays piercing the early morning mist. High amongst the leaves and branches, a tangled mess of thick blonde fur and lanky limbs can be seen. It is a group of muriki monkeys, still sleeping in each other's arms. Males, females and infants, all peacefully dreaming, together. When compared with most other primates, it's easy to see why the murikis are considered to be unique. Not only are they the largest monkeys found in the New World, but they are also uncommonly cooperative. Nicknamed the Hippie Monkey, these long-tailed, pot-bellied primates lead remarkably harmonious lives. Free from the bonds of social hierarchy, violence is rare, and food, territory and even mates are shared equally. They often start their days by hugging each other, 
and males can be seen patiently waiting in line to mate with receptive females. In a world where most primates battle for dominance and the right to monopolize resources, murkies are curious outliers. For Dr. Karen Stryer, an American anthropologist, these strange primates and their curiously peaceful societies were hard to ignore. She began studying them in the 1980s, and much of our current knowledge of murky monkeys is thanks to her and her colleagues. Within the first year of her studies, Stryer quickly realized that in murky society, as in egalitarian human societies, females are equal to males and they continue to be viewed as important members of the group even as they age and lose fertility. For murikis, grandmothering is as vital for infant survival as it is in humans, and there is very little intra-group violence and competition for access to mates. In this sense, the monkeys may be even more peaceful and egalitarian than humans, because mates are shared equally, and males will not fight for the sole right to mate with a female. And yet, as peaceful cooperative primates, murky monkeys present an intriguing paradox. Despite their seemingly complex social life that hints at higher cognitive abilities, their brains do not outsize those of their fellow New World monkeys. This is also true of another New World monkey, the Capuchin. Despite having smaller brains than apes, Capuchins have proved time and time again that they possess cognitive abilities surprisingly similar to our own. For instance, in a 2005 study published in the journal Nature, a team led by Professor Laurie Santos of Yale University presented Capuchin monkeys with an economic model to observe their behavior. The researchers taught the monkeys to use small silver discs as money that they could exchange for food. The Capuchins quickly understood the concept, using their newfound currency to purchase grapes, apples, and other treats. Once the Capuchin monkeys had learned to use this money, the researchers introduced price changes and other economic variables. Remarkably, the monkeys responded just like humans would in similar situations. When the price of food, the number of discs needed to buy a piece of fruit, fell, the monkeys bought more. When it rose, they bought less. They even displayed the capacity for rational decision-making based on price fluctuations, showing a basic understanding of budgeting and economic decision-making. But the real surprise came when the researchers observed a male capuchin purchasing a grape from a researcher and then giving it to a female capuchin, who immediately ate it. Afterwards, the female capuchin and the male mated. This was repeated several times throughout the experiment, leading researchers to the startling conclusion that the Capuchins were effectively using money for more than just food. They were using it for social purposes. Yet Capuchin society is a far cry from that of the peaceful Muriki. Capuchins live in troops led by an alpha male, who decides which outsiders may join the group, where the troop will forage, and even which members may eat before the others. And when two troops cross paths, the Capuchins confront each other with screaming, rock hurling, and physical violence. And so, whether violent or egalitarian, it can be surprising to see such human-like behaviours in species that we often consider to be vastly different from us. But it is important to highlight this idea of a shared ancestor. Humans and monkeys are not on the same journey. Though we are both primates, other apes and other primates in general are of course not simply less evolved humans. We did not evolve from monkeys. We did not evolve from chimpanzees or gorillas. Scientists calculate the ancestors of New World monkeys like the Muraki and Capuchin diverged from our own ancestors nearly 40 million years ago, long before even the ancestors of the other great apes. Recent estimates finally splitting us definitively from the ancestors of chimpanzees and bonobos around 6 million years ago. But these evolutionary cousins do give us a sense of our history, and the possible behaviours and capacities of our shared ancestors. Indeed, despite their relatively distant relation to us in comparison to the other great apes, the brains of monkeys like murikis and capuchins are still relatively large compared to their bodies. And this is true 
of all primates. This trait, known as encephalization, is often associated with high intelligence. The larger an animal's brain is, in comparison to the size of its body, the more encephalized, and potentially more intelligent, it is considered to be. Unsurprisingly, the most encephalized animals on the planet are humans, and our ape cousins follow closely behind us. But size isn't the sole measure of the intelligence in ape brains. Their internal landscapes are a labyrinth of intricate structures, convoluted in ways that most other animal brains can only aspire to. The neocortex is a perfect illustration of this. This is the area of the brain which is commonly associated with higher brain functions, such as sensory perception, motor control, spatial reasoning, and of course, cognition. It is noticeably developed in apes, more so even than monkeys, and especially well developed in humans. In fact, the human neocortex accounts for about 76% of our total brain volume. The prefrontal cortex is also disproportionately larger in apes, and since it is thought to be responsible for future planning, decision-making, and complex social behavior, it is likely that we have this area of our brains to thank for many of our advanced abilities. And so, while monkeys certainly possess intelligence, they don't quite exhibit the behaviors associated with the prefrontal cortex to the same extent that apes do. Apes are capable of executing various tasks that we generally associate with being distinctly human. A compelling example of this can be seen in the theory of mind. The ability to understand other people by ascertaining their mental state. An international team of researchers from Germany and Scotland sought to explore if chimpanzees, bonobos and orangutans, some of our closest primate relatives, could also exhibit this trait. In this experiment, the apes were presented with a straightforward scenario. A human, person A, would place an object in one of two boxes while an ape observed. Person A would then leave the room, and person B would come in. Person B would take the object from its box and place it in a different box. They would then lock both boxes. The researchers were less interested in whether the apes could locate the object. They took that as a given but they wanted to see if the apes would be able to understand person A's perception of where the object was. Depending on whether they perceived that the human knew or did not know the object's location. The findings were remarkable. When person A returned and tried to unlock the box where they'd left the object, the apes helped them to open the other box, where they knew the object had been moved to by person B. These results indicated that the apes were doing more than merely tracking the object's location they were also taking into account what the human knew or didn't know, and guessed what the human's intentions were. In other words, they showcased an understanding of others' mental states. A theory of mind, much like humans. Studies like this lead us to a captivating question, a mystery that has fascinated scientists for centuries. Just how did our brains evolve into the extraordinary organ they are today? What prompted the primates, especially apes, to cultivate such voluminous, complex brains compared to almost all the animal kingdom? And how has the way we think and behave today been influenced by this journey? It's likely that many of the earliest primates did not have especially large brains. Indeed, many researchers draw comparisons between them and modern lemuriforms. Lemuriforms, or strepsirrhine primates, are a group that includes lemurs and their close relatives, and they are amongst the most primitive living primates. They therefore offer fascinating insights into the early evolution of primate brains. The brains of lemurs are smaller and simpler in comparison to haplorine primates, which is the lineage that includes tarsiers, monkeys, apes, and therefore us. And unlike haplorine brains, the brains of lemurs have comparatively well-developed olfactory regions because they rely more heavily on their sense of smell to navigate the world around them. A classic feature of haplorine primates, especially humans, is the extensive folding of brain tissue. This is known as gyrification, and it is what gives our brains their characteristic wrinkled appearance. Notably, this extensive folding and wrinkling of the brain is absent in the lemurs, 
suggesting that they have less neuronal density and slower communication between brain cells. And so too, early primates would have had small brains, comparable in size and complexity to modern lemurs. The neural structure was also likely less complex, with a less developed neocortex, the area associated with many higher brain functions. However, by the time the ape lineage had emerged some 25 million years ago, it was clear that we were destined for something truly unique. Dwelling in the lush rainforests that once spanned much of our planet were some of the earliest primates that we can recognize as apes. They were small, arboreal creatures climbing through the trees with an agility that made them perfectly adapted to their life in the canopy. These were the Proconsulids, a family of some of the earliest known apes, and they thrived in the tropical forests of Africa during the Miocene Epoch. They had brains that were larger than those of earlier primates, but that isn't all that links these pioneering creatures to modern apes. They also had superior grasping abilities compared to their monkey relatives and ancestors, and what's more, they lacked tails, just like all living apes. Together, these features seem to hint at the beginnings of a remarkable evolutionary journey. As millions of years slipped by, the brains of these early apes started to grow larger and more complex. An increasing reliance on fruit as a primary food source may have been one driving force. Fruit is often dispersed and seasonally available, requiring animals to remember and navigate to specific locations at specific times, tasks that demand a more advanced brain. Then the climate began to change. As Africa collided with Europe, it sparked a cascade of environmental changes. The lush forests began to retreat, replaced by grasslands. Some apes followed the tides of the forest and evolved into similar forms that we know of today. Dryopithecus, for example, may have resembled modern-day orangutans. But others went a different route. This changing environment set the stage for the evolution of a new kind of ape, one capable of living in both the diminishing forests and the emerging open habitats. Arboreal Proconsul had a cranial capacity of just 167 cubic centimeters, whereas savannah and woodland-dwelling Australopithecus had a cranial capacity of nearly three times that. But earlier than Australopithecus and closer to our ancestors' divergence from the ancestors of chimpanzees, Sahelanthropus from 7 million years ago provides a perfect example of the relationship between habitat and brain size. Making its home in the mosaic woodland savanna habitats of Chad, at the crossroads between North and Central Africa, it carried a unique feature that possibly offered it an evolutionary advantage in adapting to these shifting landscapes. Every vertebrate on Earth shares a crucial anatomical detail. A hole in the skull, where the spinal cord forms its connection with the brain. In humans, the foramen magnum resides at the skull's base, centrally positioned behind our mouths. Contrarily, quadrupedal creatures, including non-human apes, have their foramen magnum leaning towards the back of the skull, aligning with their spines for a more horizontal posture. Remarkably, Sahelanthropus bore a foramen magnum akin to that of modern humans, positioned at the base of its skull. This singular attribute strongly suggests a groundbreaking interpretation. Sahelanthropus was likely bipedal. This trait has led to speculation placing Sahelanthropus potentially as the earliest species on the human branch of our evolutionary tree. As bipedalism took root in this forebear, its hands were free to manipulate objects with greater dexterity, which may have set the stage for subsequent hominins to evolve the use of tools, an attribute that would profoundly shape the course of our species' development. Free hands and the tools they held allowed later hominins access to calorie-rich foods like meat and bone marrow. These calories would be vital in fueling another threefold increase in cranial size, Large brains, in energy terms, are very expensive. 
Homo sapiens have now reached the very pinnacle of encephalization thus far of any species on Earth, with an average cranial capacity of around 1400 cubic centimeters. Compare that with the average cranial capacity of our closest evolutionary relatives, the chimpanzees, at around 360 cubic centimeters, and it becomes clear that humans have undergone a huge expansion in the size of our brains, and that this likely heralded the birth of cognitively complex behaviors, including language, abstract thinking, and advanced problem-solving skills. The journey of the ape brain from the primitive proconsul to the derived Homo sapiens has been an extraordinary tale of evolutionary innovation, a response to changing environments and complex social behaviors. When we look into the eyes of a chimpanzee or an orangutan, we see a reflection of ourselves. The echo of a journey that began millions of years ago in the trees of an ancient world under the same ancient pressures. But how much have we really diverged? What have we lost in the more than six million years we've been apart? And what do we still have in common? Imagine you are in the African savanna. Walking haltingly on two legs, a chimpanzee is making his way through the branches above you. One of his long-fingered hands grasps an overhead branch for balance, and in the other he carries a sharp wooden spear. A little way behind him, a small group of companions follow, deathly silent in anticipation of what is about to happen. You watch the scene unfolding before you in fascination. Something about this hunter makes you feel a curious sense of kinship. Instinctively, you know to keep your distance, but you recognize him as something similar to yourself. But of course, this hunter has been separated from humans by up to eight million years of evolution. One moment, the hunter is stationary, poised and at the ready near the trunk of the tree, and then he is plunging his spear into a small hollow that you hadn't even noticed. The moment is so precise and so violent it takes your breath away. Fortunately, your gasp seems to go unnoticed, because within seconds, a small mass of bloodied fur is pulled from the hollow, and the entire landscape erupts with sound. The hunter's companions immediately let out shrill cries of excitement, and their friends and families who have been watching from below add to the din with shouts and cries of their own. In their society, one successful hunt is cause for the whole group to celebrate, because everyone stands a chance to share in the spoils. Limp prey clutched in hand, the hunter descends to the ground. His companions are close behind him, already badgering him for a share of the meat. Inside the hunter, however, a battle is being waged. On one side, his instincts tell him to defend his prize with tooth and nail. This is his victory and his alone. Yet on the other, his reason tells him that he has a strong bond with these individuals, and he remembers times when they shared with him in the past. If he doesn't reciprocate, they may scorn him, and they certainly won't share with him in the future. Reason wins the fight, and he allows each of them to take a portion of the meat. He also gives a share to some of the highest ranking members of the group. The matriarch and her retinue of popular females each get a piece, as to the dominant male and his closest allies. But there isn't much to go around, and by the time the hunter has given all the important members of the group their shares, there is barely enough left for him. He guards the remainder of the meat closely, and doesn't let anyone get close enough to so much as smell the carcass. But for these chimpanzees, the sharing of food, especially such valuable food, is not about generosity or charity. It's about politics. The hunter is a young male who learned the spear hunting technique from his mother and is keen to establish himself within the group. His mother was not a high-ranking female, but he has grand aspirations and meat is the foundation on which advantageous friendships are built. This is a prime example of the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, first proposed by primatologist Franz de Waal in 1982. 
The idea that even seemingly altruistic acts in a chimpanzee society can be driven by self-interest and a need for dominance. And this hypothesis goes even further, arguing that this need for higher cunning actually drove the expansion of our brains. But more generally, this also shows us our chimpanzee relatives' complex relationship with tools. In 2007, anthropologist Jill Preetz and her colleagues observed this specific situation in a group of chimpanzees native to the rugged savanna forest landscape of Fongoli, southeastern Senegal. With temperatures often reaching 40 degrees centigrade and with dry seasons lasting seven months out of every year, it's a challenging environment to live in. But the mosaic of open grassland and woodland found here recalls the kinds of environments where our hominin ancestors evolved. This is part of the reason why Preetz was particularly interested in studying the Fongoli chimpanzees. Not only do they live in similar environments to those of our ancestors, but they also happen to be some of the most prolific tool users in the natural world. For these chimpanzees, tools are as much a way of life as they are for humans. Like us, they make and use a variety of different tools for a variety of different purposes. They use heavy, percussive tools to crack open hard-shelled nuts. They produce specially modified sticks to extract termites from their otherwise impenetrable mounds. And they even use toothpicks to clean their teeth. But these are fairly ubiquitous chimpanzee behaviors. What makes the Fongoli chimps so interesting is that they are one of the only non-human primate populations known to regularly hunt with tools. Thanks to advances in science, we now know that chimpanzees and bonobos are our closest living evolutionary relatives. So it seems logical to assume that many behaviours present in humans may also be found in chimpanzees and bonobos. Indeed, pioneering research from the last half century has revealed several facets of ape behaviour that were hitherto unknown. Take Jane Goodall. Through her long-term field study of the Casaquila chimpanzee community in the 1960s, she showed that our ape cousins are capable of much more than we once gave them credit for. Goodall got to know the chimpanzees she lived with, even giving them names, and demonstrated that not only did they make and use tools, but they also had social lives as rich and complex as the most extroverted humans. They formed lasting, loyal friendships, political alliances, and close bonds with their families. They also spent hours grooming and touching one another, and looking after those less fortunate than themselves. And what's more, they were capable of sophisticated communication, having dense lexicons of gestures and vocalizations that we are only just beginning to decipher. And this was merely a single chapter in the annals of chimpanzee sociology, since Goodall's pioneering field study, a multitude of other groups have been discovered to show similar behavioral patterns. Yet, amidst the intrigue and discovery, Goodall also stumbled upon something else. A harrowing and haunting mirror held up to human nature. The four-year war between the Kasakila and Kahama communities. From 1974 to 1978, she could only watch as a chillingly methodical war was waged. The first victim was a lone male, Godi, who was feeding on a tree. Six Kasakila males threw him to the ground and beat him until he stopped moving. The third attack was on an elderly male, Goliath. One of his five attackers was observed twisting his leg as if trying to dismember it. One of the young males, Sniff, survived for long enough that it was thought he might escape or be welcomed back into the victorious community. But in the end, he too was savagely killed by the warband. By its end, the Kahama community had been reduced to little more than a haunting memory for Goodall, with every male member of their faction brutally extinguished. The victorious Kasakila chimpanzees, unscathed and emboldened, expanded their dominion into the vacant territory. Yet in an ironic twist of fate, they were subsequently pushed back by the relentless tide of yet another community of their own kin. And this was not a one-off. 
Many years later, a decade-long study in Uganda revealed a complex web of primal politics and territorial struggles among an entirely different band of chimpanzees. The researchers conducting their study in the dense forest of the Ngogo and Kibale National Park observed a primarily male faction of chimpanzees orchestrating 18 vicious attacks on neighbouring factions, all in the name of securing additional resources and mates. According to John Mitani, a primate behavioural ecologist at the University of Michigan who led the study, the conquering chimpanzees swiftly began to claim the land that once belonged to the defeated factions. A testament to their human-like drive to expand into new territories, no matter the cost. And so just as in humans, chimpanzees' advanced cognition gives them a range of tools. Tools that can lead to either peace or war. Their empathy and compassion can build strong bonds, keeping a community together, but these bonds can also form different groups. Roaming warbands who murder with swift, brutal coordination. But what about our other, closest evolutionary relatives? The bonobos. Surprisingly, they are a completely different story. Unlike the male-dominated groups of chimpanzees, bonobo's social structure is largely matriarchal. Females form strong bonds and alliances, often through grooming and physical contact. These bonds allow female bonobos to collectively dominate males, reducing the incidence of aggression and violence that is more frequently observed in chimpanzee societies. Bonobos are also renowned for their high levels of sexual behaviour, used not just for reproduction, but also for conflict resolution, tension relief, bonding, and even greetings. Apart from humans, bonobos are some of the only other animals in the world to have sex just for the pleasure of it. This behaviour is observed in various combinations of males and females, and it underscores the importance of sexual activity in maintaining social harmony in bonobo communities. Bonobos also display a wide array of empathetic behaviours that echo our own. They've been observed comforting each other, sharing food, and cooperating in tasks. Researchers have even studied whether bonobos, known for sharing food with others, would still help without any expected reward. Conducting experiments at Lola Ya Bonobo Sanctuary in the Democratic Republic of Congo, researchers arranged unfamiliar bonobos in pairs across fenced rooms, with a piece of apple hanging above one room. A bonobo could trigger the apple to fall into the other room, accessible only to the stranger. Again and again, the bonobos release the apple without any incentive, indicating a strong motivation to assist strangers. This peaceful, empathetic and cooperative nature of bonobos stands in direct contrast to the more aggressive and competitive societies of chimpanzees, and provides a contrasting mirror for our own species. By studying our primate relatives, we can gain insight into our own nature and the evolutionary forces that have shaped our behaviours and cognition. So, as it transpires, humans are not so unique after all. As Wallace and Darwin indicated well over a century ago, humans are apes. Seven million years ago, the paths of our ancestors diverged from those of the other great apes including gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and chimpanzees. And despite the subsequent separate paths of evolution, human and ape brains retain remarkable similarities. Both human and other ape brains are structured similarly, having a large, wrinkled cerebral cortex, the area responsible for higher thought processes like decision-making, problem-solving, and language. This wrinkled appearance is a shared trait, designed to pack more neurons into a confined space. A striking feature of ape brains is the frontal lobe, which plays an integral part in social interactions. In humans and apes, it is involved in processing social information, such as the facial expressions and gestures of others, enabling us to empathise, negotiate, deceive, and reconcile. These complex social behaviours are a trademark of primate societies, something that sets us apart from other mammals. 
Our brains and those of apes also share an area known as the Broca's area. This area, vital for speech production in humans, has a similar structure in apes, despite their lack of spoken language. Interestingly, apes use this area for communicative gestures, suggesting an evolutionary precursor for our own language abilities. We both exhibit brain lateralization, meaning that the left and right hemispheres specialize in different tasks. In humans, the left hemisphere usually handles language and logic, while the right is more involved with visual and spatial tasks. Apes show a similar pattern, hinting at a shared ancestral trait. However, while all this highlights many similarities, it's also important to recognize the differences that arose in our separate evolutionary journeys. The human brain is larger relative to body size, has a more developed prefrontal cortex, and shows greater connectivity between different areas. These enhancements underpin our unique abilities, such as abstract thinking, complex language, and culture. And so as we reflect on our shared heritage with the apes, we find a story not just of similarity, but of divergence. Of the unique and shared traits that emerged from our common ancestry. Our brains are testament to our deep ties with the rest of the natural world, and yet also a symbol of what sets us apart. But perhaps the question should not only stop there. If we can wind the clock back and find behavioural similarities with other apes and other primates, how much further could we go? What was the first brain? If we consider the brain in its most rudimentary form, as a cluster of neurons responsible for movement, coordination and sensory processing, then it becomes clear that the need for a centralised control system becomes more pressing as animals become more complex. As the earliest animals began to move with purpose, they required a central location that could quickly process information from the environment. In short, survival in an increasingly complex world drove the evolution of increasingly complex brains. But even today, not all animals have brains. Many simple animals, like sponges and jellyfish, do not have centralised brains. They perform all their necessary functions without them. The majority of animals, from the tiniest insects to huge megafauna like whales and elephants, rely on their brains to survive and thrive. The first true brains, as we understand them, appeared in the Bilaterians, a broad group of animals that includes everything from worms to humans, around 500 million years ago. These organisms were characterised by their bilateral symmetry, meaning that they had a distinct top and bottom, as well as a clear front and back. The Ur Bilaterian, the hypothetical last common ancestor of all Bilaterians, is believed to have possessed the first simple brain. It was most likely a tiny, worm-like creature. Although it would have had only a very basic nervous system by our standards, this constituted the first brain, in the sense that it had a concentration of nerve cells at one end of its body, processing information from its environment and coordinating the animal's responses. The structure of this first brain was far simpler than even the simplest brains we see today. Modern brains, with their complex structures and specialised areas for different tasks, are the result of hundreds of millions of years of subsequent evolution. The emergence of this centralised nervous system, or brain, signified a critical milestone in animal evolution. This intricate system sparked a cascade of complex behaviours and adaptations, giving rise to the rich tapestry of animal life that paints our planet today. Certain creatures boast remarkably large and sophisticated brains, with primates serving as a quintessential example of such cerebral advancement. However, the claim to complex cognition does not belong exclusively to our lineage. On the contrary, it's a fascinating trait shared far and wide in the animal kingdom. Some of the most remarkable expressions of intelligence, creativity and emotion are found in species that could not be more different from us. 
let's begin with a journey into the deep, vast oceans with the cetaceans. Animals like dolphins, whales, and porpoises. These marine creatures in fact have brains larger than ours, and their cerebral cortices are just as convoluted, if not more so, than our own, which indicates advanced cognitive abilities. Although they once were thought to be fish, cetaceans are mammals that are descended from land-dwelling creatures, and share a common ancestor with hippos. Perhaps it's due to the challenges of their marine environment that cetaceans have evolved levels of intelligence that are comparable with our own. Consider the playful dolphins, masters of complex social networks akin to human societies. Known for their keen problem-solving skills, dolphins have been observed using marine sponges as tools to protect their beaks while foraging on the ocean floor, an intriguing parallel to human tool use. Bottlenose dolphins, the second most encephalized animals on the planet, even demonstrate self-awareness and have what is known as signature whistles, which they use to refer to one another in a remarkably similar fashion to human names. As well as this, the intricate, diverse songs of humpback whales suggest a form of language filled with complex grammar and structure. It's also been shown that these songs change and evolve throughout populations, with each population singing a variation of a different song each year. This is evidence that humpbacks are capable of cultural transmission, a trait traditionally associated with humans and some apes. However, cetaceans actually have one key element that primate brains lack, their ability to see the world through sound. Echolocation. Dolphins and sperm whales emit a series of clicks, interpreting the returning echoes to construct a sonic image of their surroundings. This biosonar system is so refined that they can distinguish a small fish from a grain of sand 50 meters away. Such sophisticated echolocation has driven the evolution of an incredibly complex auditory cortex within their brains. Their neural architecture is therefore dramatically different from other mammals, reflecting the significant role that acoustic information plays in their lives. For instance, the region of their brain dedicated to auditory processing is substantially larger and more developed than ours, underscoring the importance of sound in their world. Now let's return to the plains of Africa, where elephants roam. Their brains are the largest among land animals, and they are known for their extraordinary memories. Like humans, elephants can remember individuals from within their complex social structures even after years of separation, and research has shown that elephants can recall events that happened to them as babies throughout their lives. What's more, elephants have been observed performing behaviours indicative of empathy, grief, and even altruism. They comfort distressed members of their group and have been seen to grieve and pay respects to their dead, standing vigil and touching the bones of the deceased. Such emotional depth was once considered a uniquely human trait, yet here it is, abundant in the heart of the African savannah. They also showcase a sophisticated understanding of their world. Their problem-solving skills are exceptional, demonstrated in instances where they modify branches to swat away flies, or fill up and carry tools like bark or stones to thwart electric fences. A major driving force behind their intelligence is the peculiar anatomy of their brains. Enormous and convoluted, an elephant's brain has more cortical neurons than a human brain, aiding in managing their intricate social structures and mastering the versatile use of their trunks. Where human and ape brains have large, well-developed frontal lobes, reflecting an adaptation for exceptional eyesight, and cetacean brains are characterized by adaptations for auditory processing, elephants have large hind brains, the area of the brain associated with fine motor control, for obvious reasons when one considers how they use their trunks like an extra grasping limb. And so, we carry the echoes of our shared evolutionary history with the broad spectrum of the animal kingdom. From the communal intelligence of dolphins to the empathic connections within elephant herds, we are clearly not alone in our intelligence. Our planet is brimming with minds that are capable of remarkable feats, minds that demonstrate cognition, emotion and behaviour strikingly similar to our own. 
Recognizing this not only broadens our understanding of intelligence, but also deepens our appreciation and respect for the complex tree of life. You've been watching the entire history of humankind. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.